Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining today's webinar. Um, today's webinar's title is A New Way of Learning. Is, it, online education, is online education the future? Thank you very much, attendees and panelists and students joining today's webinar. I would like to take this opportunity to thank um, Dr. Tafida Jirbawi, uh, Mrs. Shireen Yakub, uh, Mr. Anas Hashami, and uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Fernando uh, Remes, who is joining us in shortly. Um, today's webinar is going to be investigating how COVID-19 has affected education and what impact it uh, left on the process of education. Indeed, uh, there are a lot of hurdles, obstacles, and challenges that students across the globe that students across the globe faced. Indeed, in this webinar. We are going to go deeper and dive deeper with our panelists based on their very profound expertise in the field of education and in their area of working in NGOs. As a matter of fact, um, I would like also to let you hear from the uh, panelists about their career life. Uh, so uh, let's, um, I'm, I'm going to begin with the introduction uh, that I will hand over for each panelist. Uh, I would like to uh, start with uh, Dr. Tafida. Dr. Tafida, thank you very much for joining uh, today's webinar. I would like you please in uh, one minute, briefly please, to introduce yourself to the audience. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, mute if uh, if you don't mute, please take one minute to mute um, the mic because it just uh, it's noisy in the background. Here we go, Dr. Tafida. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Tafida, can you mute for a second? Yeah. Are you muted? Are you muted? Uh, I'm asking you, please, um, to mute so that we can hear uh, you well. Okay, Ms. Uh, Dr. Tafira, can you please talk now? Can you talk now, Dr. Tafira? Yes, 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 where is this problem coming from? I cannot hear you, indeed. Um, <laughs> the mute what? Did you try muting yourself better? Okay, you hear me now? 
Yes, I hear you. Okay, brilliant. Now it's uh, clearer, indeed. Uh, can you start, please, talking, uh, Dr. Tafida? Yes, uh, I have three stops in my career life. Uh, I started as a, a university teacher and a, a department head of chemistry at Birzeit University, Palestine, and then moved to uh, becoming a dean of the educational uh, faculty uh, for teacher, teacher education um, and vocational and technical education for uh, uh, women, uh, which is run under the supervision of UNRWA. It is a college for women run uh, by UNRWA. And my last stop was as the Director General of uh, Ta'awun, which is the biggest uh, philanthropic uh, non-governmental organization in Palestine. Brilliant. Thank you, Dr. Tafida, for joining today's webinar. I'm moving uh, to Mrs. Shireen Yakub. If you would like to please uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Thank you, Badr. Hello, everyone. Very happy to join you today. Uh, please forgive us for the technical glitches, but hopefully we will make it up to you. Uh, I'm Shireen Yakub. I currently have the honor of being the Idraq platform. Uh, before joining uh, Idraq, we will talk about more. I've been in the skills uh, and youth development field. Uh, I'm also a mother for two boys uh, and a firm believer of uh, working moms. Thank you very much. Mrs. Uh, Shireen for uh, joining today's webinar. Um, Mr. Yanis Shami, can you hear me? Hello, Mr. Anas. Would you please introduce yourself to the audience? Yes, uh, better. Hello, everyone. I'm Anas Shami. A uh, 20-year-old Palestinian lives in Gaza, one of Al-Fakhura's students, a uh, junior student at Al-Quds Oban University, studying English language and literature. Also, beside my study, I work as a freelancer in content writing. Actually, I'm super proud and glad to have a seat, even virtually, with some stars in our world, hoping that one day uh, the honor to meet in real life. So eager to share my thoughts with you, and I'm sure that we will have a fruitful conversation today. Can't wait. Thank you very much, Ms. Anas. Uh, Professor Fernando, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I, yes, I do hear you well. I can, and can, uh, is my camera on? Can you see me? I cannot see you actually i don't know why i don't know why i think you need to make me a panelist all right the, whoever is managing the, te the technology should make me a panelist right um i'm trying to make you a panelist yeah my camera is on Can you please, because you're already uh, a panelist, uh, Professor Fernando, can you please try to uh, open your camera? Yes, uh, Professor. Yes, can you I, yes, I can hear you and see you. Uh, thank you very much for joining today's webinar. Uh, I would like uh, uh, actually to hear from you. Uh, can you please introduce yourself to the audience, Professor? Yes, my name is Fernando Rimers. I am a professor of the practice of international education 
at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where I direct the Global Education Innovation Initiative, which is a research uh, effort to improve the relevancy of public education around the world. And for the last three months, I have been working with my colleagues doing research that can help sustain educational opportunity during the COVID-19 pandemic around the world. That's amazing. Thank you very much for joining this uh, webinar, uh, Professor Fernando. Uh, my name is Badr al Zahana. I am the moderator of this uh, webinar, which is going to be talking about online education. I am a 22-year-old fresh graduate from uh, graduated from Al Azhar University, Gaza, Palestine, and I received Al Fakhura Scholarship Program in 2017, and now I, I am now a Al Fakhura alumnus. I had a non-degree experience in Indiana University, Cal School of Business in the USA, and I uh, participated in many of Al Fakhura scholarship programs, um, uh, initiatives, uh, and projects and leadership uh, uh, events. So, uh, well, now uh, we are going to start um, the webinar with the first question for uh, Mr. Anas Shami. Mr. Anas, um, you told us that uh, you are a student at Al Quds Open University. A few months overnight, a few months ago overnight, you began to go to the shift learning online. So can you please tell us a little bit about your personal experience about online learning? Well, better, you know, we are the humankind learns more through interact. So students tend to go with the on campus style rather than the online learning, even though it's more expensive. But we tend to exchange our experience through interaction and go to see each other and shake hands and this stuff. But not only the students themselves weren't prepared enough, but also the professors and universities in general were struggling to get copes with the sudden shift. This has affected the level of commitment the students show. Personally, I have faced some challenges actually that affected my experience with the distance learning. Amongst these challenges are, let's start with the new atmosphere and how to deal with the screen style learning instead of being in the campus. Um, another challenge is the stress. You know, my, my university has assigned me too many assignments within a tight deadline. So yes, um, which has uh, a huge burden upon us. Also, the distractions. The distractions also considered a huge challenge that I'm trying my best to get over it. But in my view, the solution for these distractions can be in making the online sessions more amusing, more fun, and have a variety of activities. Uh, actually, comparing to my peers here in Gaza, my challenges were less than my peers' ones. And thanks to Al-Fakhura program, which provides me with all the support, academic consulting sessions, and even the technical, all the technical requirements. Uh, so, and from this respectful platform, we as youth strongly appeal to the decision makers to provide every single student in this, in, in these marginalized in the camps, the Palestinian camps out there, Gaza, out there, Palestine, uh, which, what, uh, whatever the facilities are, it itself to ease our mission to have our right to learn. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shanas. Um, now I'm moving to Professor Fernando. Remers. Professor Fernando, one of your many accomplishments is the founder and director of International Education Policy Master's program at Harvard University. We heard from some of the, chal the challenges that Sanas faced as a student here in Gaza. Please tell, me, t tell us about some of your personal experiences as a professor during the sudden shift to online learning, some of the obstacles that you or your colleagues and Harvard University faced and how you overcame them. Thank you. Sure, Harvard University made the decision to conclude our last semester, our spring semester remotely after our public health authorities and our governor 
uh, declared a public health emergency and encouraged everyone in the state to physically distance. And we made that decision the week before our spring break, which is a one-week break that takes place in the middle of the spring semester. And these helped all, all of us in the university spend that week making adjustments so that we could complete the semester remote, remotely. I'd say the most important element of our transition was to think clearly about our goals, to have priorities, and to have a strategy that was aligned with those goals. Now, our first goal was to ensure the continuous well-being of our students. Now, remember that we now had students dealing with a public health emergency, deciding whether to remain in their dormitories, whether to travel back to their homes, which for many of them involved international travel. And they had to make that decision, that difficult transition, in a matter of days. So we were aware that our students were facing unusual stress and that this was accentuated by the impact that the pandemic was having on their families. For many of those families, the pandemic impacted their health or their income because many businesses and organizations closed down. The United States went from having unemployment under 3% to close to 18% in a matter of weeks. Now, faculty and administrators prioritize creating opportunities to be in communication with our students, to remain present in their lives, to understand their individual situation, and to support them as best as we could. And the support that we offer was differentiated based on the needs of each student. Some of them receive technology devices. Some of them receive financial assistance. Some of them receive mental health counseling. The master's program that I direct we began a weekly meeting with the students online just to check in to see how everyone was doing. And these efforts to sustain community were highly valued by our students. One of the things we began to do was very periodic surveys just to check in how everything was going, how the classes was going and so on. Now, our second goal in that strategy was to support the continued academic progress of our students. And so we had to redesign our courses and pedagogy so we could complete the semester remotely. Now, as I mentioned, we had a week uh, during the break to make that transition. And that involved some pedagogical decisions about how the course was going to be completed. For example, we tried to reduce the duration of sessions or to build a variety of different activities. So the class I was teaching on educational innovation involves a three-hour lecture every week and a two-hour discussion every week. Now, the three-hour lecture had to be redesigned because spending three hours on Zoom is unbearable. And so we began with meetings in small groups where students checked in with one another and related the content of the course on innovation with how the world was changing in front of their eyes and how this was transforming educational needs. Our weekly classes now became more of a blend of discussion, breakout rooms, a variety of activities, and much more time for individual meetings that I and my teaching fellows held with our students to discuss their projects. Now, there were some positives, some benefits to our ability to transition online. For example, in this class on educational innovation, I invite education entrepreneurs to discuss their ventures with my students. And now I was able to invite entrepreneurs from anywhere in the world. In, in the online platform that we're using, this gave us an experience as if we we're all in the same room. Now, I realize we were very fortunate that we have a very good technological infrastructure and we have excellent teams in teaching technologies who work very rapidly with each faculty member, providing guidance over what kind of technologies would help us achieve our goals. Most people in the university use Zoom as a platform for synchronous communication and other platforms to facilitate continuous interaction. Now, the pandemic provided us many teachable moments. For example, one of the things we try to teach our students is to take responsibility, to develop their responsibility to advance educational opportunity. And as educational opportunity was being interrupted globally, we had the opportunity to be helpful. So I redirected my research project, my global initiative, which is help focused on helping transform public education to provide a more relevant education, to now begin to study how to continue to educate primary and secondary students during the pandemic. And I have placed on the, on the chat 
uh, in this platform two links to some of the studies that we conducted very quickly over the last three months. Now, I invited my students to collaborate with me in these efforts, and also my former students. And I also invited colleagues at the OECD, at the World Bank, uh, to join us. And as a result of that, many of my students and former students were able to contribute, even if in small ways, to generate knowledge that was useful to sustaining educational opportunity during what is, frankly, a global calamity. And I think that is part of our mission as an educational mission, to basically help our students develop a mindset that in a time of great need, you don't just look at your own needs, you look at the needs of other people, of those who have less privilege than you do, and you try to be helpful. Now, the main challenge that I personally face were the many long hours each day that were now required, not only to continue my teaching and to support the well-being of my students, but to continue my research. I was embarked on two big projects where my students were collaborating with me, writing two books. And we had to finish the books. It would have been very easy to say, look, this is a calamity, let's postpone it. But I felt it was very important to teach by example. And to teach by example means I had to make an extra effort and say, this work continues to be important. It was an expression of hope, of hope that at the end of this long night, the sun will rise again and that we will need to be ready to help with the transformation of education. So we actually did finish the books. Uh, the books were peer reviewed. They will be published in the next few months, and I'm so glad we're able to do that. But I now, I now had these new demands of trying to generate research that was helpful. And I was talking with groups of 3,000, 5,000 people in various countries, and frankly, it was exhausting. I was getting on the computer every day at 7 a.m. and on the computer until 9 p.m. So obviously, not very healthy and not very sustainable. Thank you very much for this deep insight, Professor Fernando, and I hope that the books are going to be released soon. Uh, thank you very much. Now I'm going uh, to Mrs. Uh, Shireen Yaku. Uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Shireen, for joining today's webinar as the CEO of IDRA, one of the largest online platforms in the region. We're very happy to, to, to host you today. For those of us who do not know, what a drug does. And based on this, can you please tell us what a drug does? And as a nonprofit organization, what would you say uh, were the key challenges that you faced at the beginning of the pandemic? Thank you. Um, a drug has been launched in 2013 14 to uh, by Her Majesty Queen Rania to uh, leverage uh, the power of technology to re revolutionize access and delivery of education in the Arab world. We seek to enable Arab societies to uh, seize their potential through the power of a high quality uh, online education. Currently, we serve uh, 3.5 million learners across the MENA region um, from different backgrounds, different age groups. They come to the platform uh, looking for high quality content in Arabic. And we offer courses uh, spanning uh, through the business, entrepreneurship, STEM, technology, and other topics. Uh, we've also recently expanded into the K-12 space through a collaboration with Google.org and the Jaffma Foundation, through which we are offering open educational resources that are aligned with the national curricula, covering various topics such as math and now English is in the making, and we have coding coming up. Uh, so speaking about the challenges or the observations we've seen um, during the pandemic. Uh, despite how hectic things have been and unprecedented, it was really heartwarming to see that during lockdowns and curfews, Arab learners chose to go online and start working on acquiring new skills and knowledge. Uh, throughout the uh, past five months, we've had 
more than uh, or almost 1 million uh, new learners signing up on the Idraq platform. And that has been truly inspiring uh, to see how eager uh, our youth are looking for educational opportunities. Obviously, the challenges our learners face are centered around the digital infrastructure uh, in their respective cities or wherever they um, live, and then uh, access to uh, the internet, sometimes uh, digital literacy. Uh, but I think that you know, COVID-19 has really uh, created this momentum towards the adoption of online education. I wouldn't say that uh, you know, uh, online education has been a silver bullet or providing the optimal solutions for disruptions, but I think we have a good start and uh, we can definitely make, meet our learners where they are and start uh, designing more uh, engaging learning experiences, leveraging all these lessons learned in order to take online education to the next level. That's impressive. I am indeed one of the learners of Idraq platform. Thank you very much, Mrs. Yeah. Sharif. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, now I'm moving to uh, Dr. Tafida. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tafida, for joining uh, us today in this webinar. Uh, it's our pleasure, indeed, that you could join us. Uh, well, first, as mentioned in your introduction, for over 10 years, you were the Director General of the Welfare Association, and you're also an active uh, founding member of many coalitions here in Palestine. A few of them are Experts for Education, the Quality Improvement Fund for Tertiary Education in Palestine, and you are also an active member in the academics of Palestine. Dr. Tafida, please, could you tell us why you decided to establish these coalitions and what were some of the key challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes. Uh, but can you unmute Dr. Tafida? Okay. Um, Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Dr. Tafida, can you unmute in order to unmuted. hear you? I am unmuted. Unmuted. Shall I uh, maybe... Uh, let me, uh, I will exit. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. So, uh, yeah, every time uh, I, I have to leave and then come back again, I don't know what's the problem. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, the, three, the three positions I assumed, uh, the formal ones in my work, uh, along with these uh, bodies, actually uh, uh, drive or work in synchrony to, uh, to transform uh, education into from, uh, you know, uh, focusing on accessibility and uh, qualitative factors into more to, to, uh, quantitative uh, uh, factors uh, like access and so on into a quality type of education. Um, and um, realizing that uh, quality education, um, the goal of the education is, is, is beyond uh, preparing human resources uh, and developing their skills into, uh, uh, you know, going beyond to the uh, social development and community development in general. Um, Accordingly, uh, if we're thinking about the three of those, or the, 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 the ones that you mentioned, uh, Badr, um, I can think of two you know, contributions or, or issues that are at the table now uh, at two levels. One, if we're talking about the formal level, which, which is actually the committees that are working with an accreditation quality assurance, and also quality improvement fund, and maybe 
the uh, higher council for uh, vocational and technical education um, the new challenge now is how to how do we ensure that online learning produces quality education uh, this requires really uh, uh, setting policies uh, to introduce the online uh, learning uh, within the educational system in Palestine and also to maybe uh, 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 issue a law um, that calls for or that forms a committee that regulates uh, the e-learning. And within these regulations, uh, one can talk about the, a number of frustrations that have been really the talk of the society since COVID-19 and since uh, the uh, uh, you know, school and the university uh, universities also shifted to online learning uh, during the crisis. These include how prepared are we when we're talking about the regulations and criteria for, uh, for e-quality for e-learning, is how ready are we in terms of the infrastructure, uh, how ready are we in terms of, uh, of teacher uh, skills, teacher training in digital skills and in, and in online learning, uh, this includes course design and also evaluation and assessment methods, which are totally different than, uh, let's say, what is really being practiced now at the education and higher education level. Uh, so we need, we need that regulations. These are not really easy to do, but they are doable. And with the formation of committees and, and a level of seriousness, uh, I think we will... Uh, we will deliver, especially because uh, technological advancement have really made this uh, possible. Um, in order also to meet all of those, it's very important to have a political will. I mean, we cannot draft policies or, or, uh, impo or let's say, draft a law and realize that law, law unless there is a political will that initiates such a thing. Now, this is where the civil society organization steps in, and this is where the other uh, uh, organizations that I, uh, you know, work with, like uh, Academia for Palestine and so on, these new coalitions that were really created after uh, COVID-19. Uh, COVID um, and so the, the role of civil society is very important. People are in the heart of change. And if we're talking about quality change, we call, and we are talking about transformational change, and I even wrote an article about educational revolution, which is really what I am calling for now, because the situation cannot really uh, uh, continue uh, like this. So the civil society organization, through the coalitions, through the fora, through also students. So far, I have not really heard the voice, the voices of students in a regulatory for, in a, uh, form. Uh, thanks, uh, brother, that you are really moderating this session and you are voicing the students' concern in this regard. Uh, these voices really, uh, along with publications and... Uh, Thank you, Dr. Uh, Safida. Yeah. Can you hear me, Doctor? Hello? Can you, yes, can you hear me? Dr. Safida? Hello? Yes? Anas, can you hear me? Professor, can you hear me? Mrs. Cherry, can you hear me? I cannot hear you. Indeed. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Uh, okay. I cannot hear you. Professor, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. And, uh, okay, uh, Anas. How about, can you hear me? I think that Anas is uh, disconnected. Well, uh, let me just move uh, to Professor Fernando, as long as you can hear me. Um, Professor, uh, now, um, uh, what's learning ex experiences? This is like the, you, you're hearing me, right? I am hearing you very well. Brilliant. So what learning experiences did Harvard Graduate School of Education take from 
this moving forward? And have there been any changes in your current program, Professor? Well, let me preface the answer by saying that I believe this pandemic is really a global calamity. So I, I want to be very clear that I would not recommend a pandemic to anyone as a, as a way to promote innovation. Having said that, the world is what it is, not what we wish it could be. And given that reality, the university then faced the question of what are we going to do next academic year, which for us begins at the end of August. And we decided about three weeks ago that the best thing to do was to teach online, to fully teach online for at least the entire fall semester and in some schools like the School of Education for the entire year. Now, this is a massive decision in our university because we had never allowed in our four century history. Uh, Professor Fernandez, just a second, please. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave the room for a second and I'm going to reconnect in order to hear you uh, well, because I cannot hear you well. Just All right. one second. I will wait and for I you to come it. back. Yes, that's fine. So obviously, one of the things that I have learned over the last uh, several months, I have been on more online conferences than I have been my entire life before. And one of the things I have learned is to try to use platforms that are well-tested and reliable. I these days become very leery when someone invites me to test a new platform with a huge risk. So anyway, uh, to go back to what we learned, uh, we made the decision to teach online this coming year. And this was a very difficult decision. Harvard has never allowed uh, us to give a degree to any student who did not spend a period of residence in our campus. And the reason we made that decision primarily was because we knew that until there is a vaccine, there is always the possibility that there will be further outbreaks and we're seeing that in the United States. We really haven't completely gotten out of the first wave. And in all likelihood, there are going to be outbreaks in September, in October. So we knew that if we came back to classes in September physically, we will in all likelihood have to But we also said, what about January? We don't know what's going to happen vaccine in January. And we don't know whether that vaccine will be available widely in January. And so that's why we made the decision to teach online. It was not an easy decision. We realize how challenging the decision is. But now that we make the decision, I'm happy that we did. Because every faculty member is spending the two months of the summer preparing our, on our courses to be the best online experience that it can be. We are receiving a lot of professional development, a lot of support from people in technology. And we decided to reopen applications to our programs. We said, if we're going to do this big experiment, let's do the full experiment. Let's see who would come. And I can tell you that the news in my school are fascinating. In the few weeks since we reopened admissions to this new online program, we had more applicants than we normally have in the regular academic year. I have talked to some of those applicants. They are extraordinary. These are people of extraordinary accomplishment, demonstrated leadership, who just have very busy lives and who, under normal circumstances, would find it impossible to leave their jobs, to leave their families, and to come to Harvard. And now, if we admit them, and I hope we'll admit a number of them, they're going to enrich our community. So I think that even though this is a global calamity, the calamity gives us the opportunity to try very different ways of doing what we normally do. And I believe that we are going to learn very valuable lessons. Uh, 
I hope that we will be up to the task. I cannot tell you how this online instruction is going to go. For me, the relevant question is not how does online compare to face-to-face? -face? Because if we can now serve students that we could never have served before when we require people to come here, and those students are extraordinary, and the impact of our education allows them to do even more extraordinary things, this is a very important lesson. Maybe we should be doing more to serve those kinds of students. Now, one of the things that I think is going to be critical for universities is how they make decisions, how they lead, and how they are managed at this time. See, universities, like any organization, can function in different ways. And I believe there is a sequence of development of institutions that goes from being very hierarchical, very top-down, very command and control, almost like the military, almost like a church, almost like a very old university. But as universities modernize, they become more achievement organizations, more professional, where decisions are made based on evidence, where you recognize that it's important to have transparency, when you recognize that it's absolutely okay for a faculty member to challenge the decisions of a president. I think that as you, if you think about Facebook, Facebook recognizes that good ideas can come from anywhere. And it would be very important for universities to evolve to a mode that recognizes that. Further progress is to be a pluralistic organization where you recognize that there may be very different goals, pe different ideas that people have about what is the best way to advance the mission. And so that recognizes, for example, that we should have a legitimate debate about who should be the students. And the question shouldn't just be, is online good for the very privileged students we have taught in the past, but what should we be teaching different students? For example, I can tell you that the applicants to these new online degrees are much more diverse racially, socioeconomically than they have ever been. And there are some of us, myself included, that believe that it honors our mission to have a more diverse group of students. So I'm hoping that we become a pluralistic organization where anyone can challenge, establish ideas about what is the right way to fulfill our mission. Now, I believe that in a pandemic, it is very tempting for universities to retreat into a hierarchical, top-down command and control to try to govern by rules. But unfortunately, if you think about it, many of the people who make decisions in our hierarchies have very limited knowledge or experience with online. In fact, some professors and some students have a lot more experience about what is possible. So I think this is going to be the biggest dilemma for universities. Do they retreat to a hierarchical, top-down, military, military style of control because they're very concerned with their future, they're very concerned with finances? Or do they trust their faculty and their students and evolve towards modes of decision-making that are more achievement-oriented, more pluralistic, more oriented to becoming democratic communities. I think the universities, the institutions that move in that direction have a better chance of responding to the challenges of our times than those who retreat to top-down governing styles. Thank you very much, Professor Fernando. Uh, now I am moving to Ms. Anas El Shami. Anas, you spoke a little bit about your personal experience and uh, shifting to online education. Would you please just uh, summarize um, your peers' experience and how, how they faced the challenges and how they um, contributed in overcoming these uh, challenges? You go, please.
I cannot hear you. Never can I. Hello, Anas. Hello, Anas. Okay, um, Anas, I cannot hear you well. I'm moving to um, Mrs. Shireen Yakub. Mrs. Shireen, can you hear me? I can hear Brilliant. You. So, uh, a drug was founded in 2013 and uh, has been offering the free online courses um, to learners since then. So, in light of the recent pandemic, how can a drug continue to support education for marginalized youth in the Middle East? Thank you very much. Uh, one of the most exciting learning experiences has been uh, working with the Ministry of Education and other partners to create a national platform for students across the kingdom. Uh, when we had the lockdown, you know, all students had to had a way to continue their education, and we wanted to contribute to sustaining learning not only in the region but. More, also in Jordan. So uh, there was a very exciting experience where we have joined effort with the Ministry of Education and other content providers to design and create a new platform that serves the uh, students across the kingdom, offering them uh, weekly content that corresponds to what would they normally take uh, in face-to-face -face, uh, education. We've learned a lot throughout the experience in terms of the importance of designing and localizing the experience to see suit the needs of uh, a specific target audience, uh, the, how important it is to uh, have solutions that are learner-centric. So uh, oftentimes during the discussions, uh, a lot of ideas would come around and the main question would be, how would the learner or the student feel about that, how would they find the content, how would they interact with the content, what would the experience would look like, and then the solution would pivot in a way that makes it quite uh, different from the initial idea. So putting the learner at the center uh, was very critical, and also uh, trying to provide a holistic approach for the online solution. So all of a sudden, we were asking everyone to go online and interact with this platform. We had to put in place, along with the partners, some uh, solutions to enable them to overcome challenges related to digital literacy. So we had to create tools for that in terms of tutorials and onboarding content, and then uh, challenges related to the infrastructure. So we really had to design for mobile and then also, there was a, a partnership with uh, the teleco sector that was led by the ministries of education and uh, digital entrepreneurship and digital economy, through which uh, abundance of free access were offered through certain times. Uh, another step was taken to use broadcast through media, uh, dedicating a TV channel. Um, that was led also by the ministry to offer some of the content. And then as we moved along, um, and this has primarily been an effort led by the ministry, there was an assessment of interactivity, how, uh, so one way uh, broadcasting obviously is not enough and it doesn't really constitute a very good learning experience. So then, uh, you know, as a response program, it gradually started evolving. And then we started considering options for assessments and interaction, uh, support groups, uh, leveraging social media. Uh, so, so that kind of thinking has really enabled us to uh, uh, build partnerships that could serve as models 
for public-private partnerships. It was a textbook example for how the private sector would come together with the uh, public sector and also uh, join efforts with the non-profit um, and uh, non-governmental institutions. Uh, there was also the experience of working with teachers uh, around building their capacity uh, in order to be able to lead, design, and implement such learning solutions. Uh, the main realization that we have com uh, come uh, to was the importance of, um, or what we call the new UBI, the Universal Basic Internet, uh, because it, we have seen how it's become a right, and it's, uh, the access to basic internet can really play an particular role in determining uh, the living standard or the ability to access certain, um, let's say, services and uh, programs to have uh, to, to sustain uh, living and learning during such times. So, all in all, I'd say that uh, you know partnerships play a critical role, and the importance of designing for learners and meeting them where they are, gradually building solutions and ensuring that we are building for scale. Can you hear me? Thank you very much, Mrs. Uh, Shireen. Uh, now I'm moving to Dr. Tafid as your bowing, please. Uh, we've seen that this pandemic has added um, to the many current obstacles that Palestinian youth uh, face to accessing quality higher education. How will this affect the current Palestinian national policy agenda or the new one? Uh, okay, um, first, on the national agenda is to be free from occupation. In order to be able to do this, which is really... We cannot hear you. You can't hear us? Uh, you can't? Can you hear me uh, better? Uh, okay, I will try to uh, close my camera. This will... Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Um, so only Badr can hear me or everybody hears me? No. Uh, Mr. Shireen, can you hear Dr. Tafida? And I can hear Dr. Tafida. And Anas, can you hear Anas? me? Okay, so Professor, I... can you hear me? No. I can hear you, but not Professor. Hey, can you hear Mrs. Shireen? Okay, let me, let me do the yes. trick I usually do. Okay, uh, Dr. Tafida? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Shall I go on? Or shall I... Let me, let me do the trick. I will do it and come back without, uh, without a camera, okay? Hello, Badr. Can you hear me now? That's good. Dr. Tafina. Can you hear me now? Hello? Can you hear me now? Uh, Professor, can you hear Dr. Tafina? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, on the national agenda... Just unstable, I guess. No? Um. Uh, what shall I do? Better, can you hear me? All right. Um, Dr. Tafida, yeah. I can't actually hear you. You cannot hear me? Can you hear me, Anas? Yes, I can. Can you hear me, you? Okay. Uh, Dr. Tafida, can, can I just return back to you until the connection is better? Um, okay, I will try to... I would like to uh, move to... Professor Fernando, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. All right. So, Professor Fernando, you're also the director 
of the Global Education um, Innovation Initiative, the Ford Foundation, Professor of the Practice of International Education, and you have written impressive 33 books specific to the field of education. In your opinion, how can we better work together as educational specialists and policy makers to ensure that we turn this experience into a positive one, especially for marginalized youth in the MENA region? It's a very important question. Now, I, I've always believed that universities have enormous capacity, a great capacity to be engines of economic and social development in the research that we do, in how we educate our students, and in the way in which we extend services to society around us. And I think this crisis is an invitation for universities to do that. For example, take the field of public health. It's very clear that schools of public health, schools of medicine, are working with governments, helping them design policies, with hospitals, taking care of people. They are part of an integrated ecosystem that is playing a critical role at this time. Now, take education. Schools, elementary and secondary schools, have to continue, have to invent ways to continue to educate during the pandemic. Universities typically have more resources than schools, and they could develop partnerships with primary and secondary schools and with governments to help them develop strategies for education continuity in the year ahead. For example, helping them develop curriculum, designing new approaches which allow to continue teaching remotely, developing teaching digital assets. Let me give you an example of what two recent university graduates did in Chile, which speaks to the question of the great power of university graduates, for example, to reach marginalized students. Now, these two graduates are part of a network called Teach for All. It's like Teach for America in 55 countries. It takes recent university graduates and places them in a high poverty school for two years. Now, the day when the Ministry of Education of Chile decided that schools would be shut down, these students said, what about our, what about our students? How are they going to continue to learn? And because they are part of a global network, they had seen in an online newsletter that two members of this network in Nigeria had begun to use their iPhones to record lessons and distribute them in WhatsApp. So they did the same thing. Their lessons were so animated, they were so interesting, that within a week, every student in that city was listening to the lessons. And then the mayor of the city realized that, and he talked to other mayors, and within two weeks, those lessons were being broadcast by 240 radio stations throughout the country of Chile, especially in rural areas, reaching very marginalized kids. Now, the reason I talk about that example is because it illustrates that, in this case, two young people who were 25, 26 years old were capable of inventing a solution that a government had not yet invented. Now, universities are full of people like this. And if university decided to embrace the challenge of being helpful, for example, to elementary and secondary schools, I'm sure they would not only be able to help solve a tremendous urgency in this crisis, but they would be providing their students an opportunity to learn to be helpful. They would be providing their students an opportunity to learn to solve complex problems, adaptive problems, which is what universities are supposed to do. And if they gain that experience, if they succeed at that experience and they build these partnerships, they could then continue that after the pandemic is over and continue to support schools, continue to support cities, continue to support societies addressing other challenges. Climate change, for example. I am at the moment conducting a study looking at how 25 universities around the world have embraced this challenge and are working with primary and secondary schools to help them continue. 
to educate. So I think universities can become hubs of an integrated and coherent ecosystem of education that can mitigate the impact of what is really a tragedy a tragedy, this pandemic that is going to rob many children of the opportunity to learn. And I think that in building that ecosystem, universities can help address many challenges that existed before the pandemic. In many places around this, the world, schools were not really doing a very good job helping students develop the capacities that they need to be resilient, to thrive in a world that is volatile and uncertainty. There, there was already a need for an education renaissance. And universities could seize this moment to not only make an important contribution to that renaissance, but to build the essential partnerships to continue building that renaissance afterwards. But as I said earlier, this will only happen if the way in which universities are governed promotes that kind of creativity, that kind of collaboration, that kind of innovation. In my research on exemplary practices of educational innovation throughout this pandemic, I have observed that leadership is key. It is, in fact, the most important asset, much more than money. And where you have a leadership that promotes communication, that breaks down barriers, silos, that recognizes that ideas can come from anywhere, that promotes communication, that promotes acting quickly and using feedback loops to correct. When you have that kind of leadership, good things are happening. On the contrary, where you have rigid leadership, leadership that tries to command by the power of authority, you stifle innovation. So I think what we need, what we need looking forward to help sustain the opportunities of marginalized students are ecosystems that have six characteristics. Number one, a mindset shift. We have to let go of our pre-existing ideas of what is the right way to do things and embrace the design thinking as a way to encourage creativity and innovation in doing the best we can in the condition we're in with the resources we have. Second, we need to act quickly. This is not a time to be bureaucratic and to be slow. This is the time to act fast, fail fast, learn fast. Number three, we need to create coherence in what we're doing. Number four, we need to create, make it possible to learn from what we're doing. Use feedback loops, rapid prototyping to learn. Number five, we need to have very clear views of how do we think of organizations and be very skeptical about this top-down hierarchical mode and embrace an achievement-oriented or a pluralistic view of organizations. And number six, we need to understand that universities can inspire others by example. That in the middle of this tragedy, the most important thing that everyone needs is hope. Not hope based on telling people lies, not hope based on denying the gravity of the crisis, hope based on leading by example and showing that in spite of all odds, it is possible to do good things. And there are people doing good things. So we should work very hard to find them, to celebrate those who are doing good things and to promote their examples. And that is what I have been trying to do with these exemplars of good practice that I have sent a link earlier. And that is something that every university could easily do. Identify who's doing good things, study that quickly, and disseminate that knowledge as a way to encourage others to do the same thing. I hope this is somewhat helpful. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, now, um, Mrs. Shireen, um, uh, what are the lessons moving forward with regards to online learning, specifically for higher education? Uh, and I need you, please, uh, briefly to talk about, uh, about the partnership and how can online learning open new doors for refugee and IDP uh, across the region? Very briefly, please. 
Thank you. Aware of the time, because I know that we only have uh, four minutes left. Uh, Professor Fernando has eloquently summarized the lessons that I would also like to share, so I won't be repeating uh, these. I would like to echo uh, his notions about uh, acting fast, limiting bureaucracy, uh, using the feedback loops. It's very important to find ways to share lessons learned so that we make sure that we learn from each other's mistakes and more importantly, not end up investing more resources in reinventing the wheel. In terms of how can online education open doors for refugees and ITPs, now we're seeing a shift in uh, the global economy. The gig economy, for example, is on the rise. Uh, your geographic location no longer dictates fully uh, your prospects. If you have access to the internet and you acquire the uh, digital skills uh, that you can monetize, that you can build your caliber uh, with, you know, you can really now have a better chance at uh, getting a job and starting a freelance uh, career uh, that helps you overpass the uh, confinements or constraints of your geographic location. Uh, it's very critical that we join efforts as stakeholders to build an enabling ecosystem where we really meet learners where they are and bridge the gaps that are currently available in the market because we really need to act fast. And sometimes, uh, or luckily, with uh, you know, ed tech and entrepreneurship, we can have rapid solutions. We can try fast, fail fast, but also uh, hopefully provide value uh, that can help students and IPPs, refugees, uh, really make or leapfrog uh, their careers. And, you know, there is now uh, more and more acceptance of micro-credentials. If you want to pivot, you want to uh, change your career, online and uh, open education platforms like IDRA can also help you overcome the financial challenges related to tuition so that you can also take such moves. Thank you very much, Ms. Shireen. Uh, now, um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, the panelists, the audience, the organizing team. Thanks a lot for Qatar Fund, Education Above All, uh, the UNDP, al Mazak, and all organizers. I would like to give my special thanks to uh, Professor Fernando, Dr. Tafira, uh, Ms. Shireen, and Mr. Anas. This session has now ended. Please exit the room by clicking the door icon in the bottom left corner of your screen. This will bring you back to the agenda page where you can then access to the next session. Be sure that you also view the next session, which is titled Beyond the Physical, the Importance of Mental Health in Times of a Crisis. We hope you enjoyed and I hope that you will enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much for joining and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you.